Hello, I'm Dr. Elry. Welcome to World Religions or Introduction to World Religions. The first thing I want you to do is I want you to go to your email where I sent you your syllabus, or I want you to go to the Blackboard page, and I want you to pull up the syllabus on your laptop or desktop or whatever you need. Um, but I want you to connect to a computer and I want you to print it out. Hit pause right now and print out your syllabus. Now that we're back, and I assume that you have all printed out your syllabus. I, I do this because I think it's important to have a physical copy of the syllabus out there. A syllabus is kind of a binding document. It's almost like this is an agreement of what we're gonna do and we should have a physical copy of it. And physical copies are somewhat real in a way that um, sort of web pages are not. So I wanted you to print out your syllabus. We're gonna go, we're gonna have a simple day today. I'm just gonna read through the syllabus. Um, and talk to you a little bit and introduce myself and set you loose to do your very simple assignment uh, for today, which is just to record an introductory video and post it to a discussion board. So um, welcome to World Religions. Um, this World Religions is going to be a little different from a lot of World Religions courses um, because we're going to actually really take an emphasis on, um, on the religions of South Asia. I'm doing this as kind of an experiment. Um, I'm curious as to whether we can teach a world religions course that puts an emphasis on Asian religions instead of Western religions. As I'll talk about in a, and when I talk about the syllabus, usually world religions courses will do one of two things. They'll talk about um, they'll talk about these religions that have made an impact on the world that are historical religions, such as Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, and then they do like, for like, you know, two weeks, they do Asian religions, or they do completely non-Western religions. They do African religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism, Jainism, and just don't even deal with the um, major religions, major religions of the West. I kind of want to use these Asian religions in order to kind of figure out a way to do proper comparison of religions and using the Asian religions to understand the Western religions. So you're gonna get a really wide breadth of material in this course. And I think it's gonna be a good time. So I'm looking forward to it. And without further ado, let's look at the syllabus. So I'm gonna share my screen right now and uh, we're gonna read through the syllabus together. Here we go. Takes me a split second. All right, uh, where's my little face? Here's my face. So this is what a lot of class will look like, except you will not have a Word document. You'll actually have a PowerPoint. I will try to always have a PowerPoint. Um, and you'll always see my face, and you'll also hear my uh, rambling, myopic, somewhat high pitch and spastic voice. Welcome to it. I'll try to make it fun. All right, so this is Religion 2601, Introduction to the World Religions. I'm Dr. Aaron Michael Ulrey. You just call me Dr. Ulrey. Why do I insist on you calling me Dr. Ulrey? I say this in every class. The thing is, I don't care. You can call me by my first name. You can call me by my middle name. Just don't call me asshole, and just don't call me late for dinner. But the important thing is mostly women and people of color, not mostly, but women and people of color have a lot of trouble getting people to use the term doctor. So it's surprising how often people call me Dr. Ulrey, and then they'll turn to another professor and call her Dr. Andrea, or just Andrea, or Katie. Um, and it's surprising. So call me Dr. Ulrey. Call all your professors Dr. Ulrey. You can call me Dr. Ulrey. You can call me professor. You can call me doctor. You can call me whatever. It's not that big of a deal to me, but I think it's really essential that we maintain the honorific title of doctor and professor for teachers of college because it does set up the formal structure of our relationship with me as your teacher um, and with your other teachers. And I wanna set a good precedence for always calling your teachers doctor or professor. They may not be doctors, so you can just go with professor. Professor works just fine. Use those with all of your teachers in college and you will be well served and you will maintain the proper decorum that fits the college professor and student relationship. All right, so this is it. Uh, I'm Dr. Elry. We're gonna be doing this online. It's gonna be asynchronous and I'm gonna have your lessons mo or lesson modules drop Tuesdays and Thursdays. 
your uh, due dates for all assignments will be Friday at noon for your Tuesday lesson and uh, Sunday at noon for your uh, Thursday lessons. And I'll say this again, but I always get emails from students like, why don't you have it at midnight? I'm like, all right, I'll have it Thursday at midnight and Saturday at midnight. Do you want the extra 12 hours or not? I think you want the extra 12 hours. One thing that will never change, and don't bother emailing me about it, is the due dates will not um, move to Friday or Sunday at midnight. They will always stay at noon. If I want, if we really want to change it to midnight, they can be Thursday at midnight and Saturday at midnight, but I don't think any of you want that. All right, so FYI, I live in Denver, um, so I'm in Colorado. I'm on Mountain Time, so I'm two hours behind you. Remember that anytime you're kind of like emailing me or if you need to call me or whatever. All right. Uh, I am Professor Michael Ulrey. Use my email address at ysuamulrey at ysu.edu. Uh, I'm teaching remotely, so I don't have an office on campus. My office hours, I, I played around with virtual office hours. I don't think they really work very well. So just make an appointment with me on Zoom, Skype, phone. I'll give you my phone number if you request it. Email, whatever you want. Well, I, I'm here for you. So do not hesitate to reach out, and we can talk about whatever you so need. How to contact me, use my e YSU email listed above. Why am I reading through this email or through the syllabus? Let me just say very briefly. If we were in person, I would be reading through this with you. It's important for you to process it. We learn through research on education that the more we read and listen and, and hear all together, the better we process information. One of my great mantras, in teaching is to try to get students to process things as many times as possible. Um, all right, so uh, please use my YSU email list above. I check email for a one hour daily period. So one hour a day, I just, I have my email open. Compose emails in formal English and strive toward professionalism in all correspondence with me and other students. An undergraduate degree is an exercise in professionalization, by which I mean, be formal, be as formal as possible. Don't use text speak, don't use abbreviations. Write in a formal manner when you're interacting with me. And this is part of sort of the secondary thing. It's more than just the content of a class. We're working towards making you the best professional people you will be. One person asked me one time, why do I need to work on formal writing in college? I said, well, at some point, you're gonna have to write. You're gonna have to write a job letter. You're gonna have a problem that you're gonna have to write to a congressman, or let's be very specific. Let's say you have a student that has special needs or a child who has special needs and you can't get a good IEP, individual education plan for them. You're gonna have to write a letter to their teacher and to the school board. And if you don't write that letter right well, and if people don't respect your tone of writing, your kid's not gonna get the services they need. So you gotta be able to write formally, compellingly and clearly. And that's gonna be part of our class. All right, so here's the course description. What is religion? What are religions? I mean, that's a big thing that a lot of people don't even think about. There is this thing we think about, it's called religion with a big R. And then other people are like, oh, there's all these religions. Well, is there one thing called religion? If there's one thing called religion, are all those religions doing the same thing? Well, think about it. What are the main religions? And what does it mean to be a main religion or major or great religion? If you're doing doing Buddhist religion, is it the same as doing Jewish religion? Are prayer and meditation the same? What is the difference between a mantra and a hymn? Do folk really understand an om to be like a crucifix? Om. What is the difference between a mantra and a hymn? As I said, blah, blah, blah. Are miracles and revelation limited to the past when God was closer to man, as they say in dispensationalism and Protestant Christianity, or do they continue? Are there miracles today? <laughs> Excuse me. What is a holy man or a woman? And how does charisma shape religious innovations? Can other beings inhabit a body, be that possession or abduction by aliens, maybe? Um, what do you do with a dead human body? Do you burn them? Do you bury them? What do you do? Can, uh, uh, can we locate active religious discourse outside of scripture, i.e. in movies, comic books, or online media? As in, there's more than just a Bible. There's more than just a scripture. Are religious folk looking to make sense of their world or are they looking to dominate their world? I.e., what is the role of power and politics in religion and religious discourse? 
these are the types of questions that are the answer, that are the engine for the course. But the destination is unclear. Together, we will destabilize our understanding of religion and religions, aiming to see the world a bit clearer and to recognize worlds previously unseen. I assure you, it will be a trip. A few words are required on the history and context of such courses. World Religions is a classic course in religion and religious studies departments, but the course title has a troubling history in which only those religions considered to affect history are considered a world religion. Contents are thereby limited to Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, since Western history is real history. Though admitting some reference to Buddhism, maybe some Hinduism, never Jainism, Sikhism, folk, relig folk religions, or animism, as in there are souls everywhere and in everything, um, or of the varied Chinese religions and African religions, let alone esoteric traditions, especially troubling is the elision of First Nations religions in the Americas. So, world religions courses. Uh, just religions that have made a difference on history. Then you wonder, what's history? What are you getting at with history? With a big H or a little H? Are there multiple histories or is there multiple history? Just like having a world languages course doesn't make a lot of sense because how could you learn all the languages or study all of the languages of the world? A world religions course is equally kind of silly because you can't study all of the religions or learn all of the, you can spend your whole life. I mean, that's what I do and I still don't know a lot. Of, I still don't know everything, let alone even a lot of stuff about all the religions of the world. So, all right, privileging religions in this manner defers to and supports not only colonial depictions of the world, but Western chauvinism. Another approach equally problematic only teaches religions that are considered non-Western. A proper world religions or religions of the world course abandon such rankings and categories in favor of studying whatever and whenever creates insights. Our goal is insight. Our goal is understanding. So we're gonna look at whatever we can to find out new stuff. This world religions course eschews preoccupations with distinctions such as monotheism, one God, and polytheism, many gods, East and West. Uh, Salman Rushdie wrote, I will not have it East, I will not have it West, I will not choose between them, never between them they will meet. Historical and ahistorical, faith versus works. It will not be divided by discrete religious boundaries, which are not as distinct as they appear. We will study religions in and of the world, not world religions. Religious discourse is diffuse and vast, the very stuff that makes up our cultures and our minds. Religions are not all the same, but folk universally encounter stuff deemed religious, and the reactions to that encounter make up and shape worldviews. Based on the Comparing Religions textbook, go buy that book now, we will develop a method to interpret and compare religious contents, placing emphasis on what folk do rather than what they think or believe. Religious discourse and rituals, mostly pulling from Indian religions, will be examined as case studies, applying the methods explored in lectures and in the textbook. So we're gonna be like, for every module, we'll have one chapter of the textbook, and then we'll have a whole bunch of like sort of case studies, different articles, academic articles, popular writing or whatnot, and um, so those sort of case studies we'll use to apply what we read about in the textbook. Um, so like I said, we're going to be mostly using Indian religions because I'm trying an experiment. This Asian orientation has the benefit of grounding our study in non-Western perspectives, eschewing predominant norms. The majority of discourse in religious studies uses Western categories to understand religion. Well, let's try using new categories and let's look at Eastern stuff, just to get a different perspective. Our whole goal is to shake everything up about what you and I think about religion and religions. Course activities compare case studies with religious experiences in the United States informed by our own opinions and experiences. So after we apply that, the, the, the case study and we apply the theory from the textbook to the case study, I'm gonna ask you to do stuff. And when you do stuff, it's going to be sort of interpreting based on your own experience or comparing what we've studied um, to what we find of religion in the West as we've experienced it, specifically religion in the United States. 
A good religious studies course makes the strange familiar and the familiar strange. This course aims not to fill students' heads with details about diverse religions, but to develop skills enabling students to richly interpret religious phenomenon and actively cultivate religious literacy. These are lifelong skills. Course materials include Jeffrey Kripal's Comparing Religions, an exciting and controversial textbook by an exciting and controversial scholar, which spans religious traditions and traditional boundaries, using religious studies theories to reveal themes, comparisons, and contrasts across religious data. It even talks about aliens and superpowers. I think you're gonna like the aliens and the superpowers. Each module explains a chapter of Kripal's textbook and some case studies. Assignments apply Kripal's theories to case studies, but then will interpret one's own religious experiences, one's own experiences of Western religion, or to make larger interpretations of religions, society, and culture. While we study the religions of others, we become aware that this study also interprets ourselves. So we're going to be studying other people's religions, but as we study other people's religions, we're gonna get some new insights into our own religious experiences, or lack thereof, you never know. Unless someone's an alien abductee, and I wanna hear about it. And if you've seen Bigfoot, I want to know. I believe it's out there, that Bigfoot. I've been to several Bigfoot museums out here in Colorado. I'm very intrigued by Bigfoots. I'm wondering if Bigfoots are aliens. I'm wondering if Bigfoots are ghosts. I don't really know. Okay, objectives. Students will be able to, these are, these are our ultimate results. Explore the development of the history of religions, religious studies, world religions, and intellectual history, which are big categories in the academy and in colleges. You're gonna critically reflect on these disciplines. Develop techniques of quality comparison, including what makes an effective comparison and an ineffective comparison. I remember I had a professor one time that said, you can compare apples and oranges all day long, but unless you establish that they're fruits, what are you doing? That's part of the comparison thing. I had another professor that always used to say, comparison for comparison's sake is odious. Comparison, when you compare things, they have to give a greater amount of insight. Like I said, you can compare apples and oranges all day long, but if you don't establish that they're both fruits and that they're different aspects of fruits, you're not doing anything. You're just listing similarities and difference or as they say all across Southeast Asia, same, same, but different. I'm like, well, same, same, but different isn't much of an argument. All right, we'll talk about this quite a bit more, especially when it comes to paper writing time. Uh, all right, so identify unexpected religions and aspects of religion, especially the religions of India. All the while, students interrogate divisions of East and West, noting common themes and divergences. World religions courses historically ignore Asian religions outside of particular forms of Buddhism. Identifying non-traditional realms of religious experience and discourse, media, artistic, paranormal, esoteric, civil religion, vernacular religions, and so forth. Articulate themes such as polytheism, religion on the ground, literary versus vernacular, pragmatic ritual technologies, and magic. By the way, uh, my main field of research is on magic in South Asia. So, I'm interested in magic, and by, by which I mean magic is pragmatic ritual technologies. These are techniques that one uses to make a discrete change in the world than, is, that is a result of a specific ritual, not out of anyone's inherent piety, the grace of God, or whatnot. The effects of colonialism, religion and modernity, and so on. Explore living religions as found in practices, texts, sites, and media artifacts gain a broad appreciation about how religions interact in and with history, write in multiple genres about religions, expand critical writing skills in conjunction with effective research. I was a writing teacher for years. I was a high school English teacher. Um, I taught writing and composition throughout uh, my graduate school work. Uh, I continue to have a very strong writing component uh, in all of my classes. If anything, for the outcomes of this class, you're gonna be a better writer. We're going to work on your writing. I promise you, you will become a better writer um, through the processes that we're gonna use and, and we're gonna work on. All right, what are our course materials? So we're gonna look at, we're, we've got for course material right here, Comparing Religions by Jeffrey Kripal. Now I looked at, I was looking around last night and you can, this is like a $50 textbook. It's the only thing you're gonna have to buy. Um, 
you can get it for 25 bucks, I think, if you get it from the used, from some used religious sources uh, or some used, used book sources. Uh, I did see, I think Amazon will let you rent it for 30 bucks and that's where you pay 30 bucks, they ship it to you, you take the class and then they pay for the shipping and you ship it back to them. Um, so, and any way you wanna do it, as long, but get a physical copy of the book. Other materials will be provided by the professor on Blackboard. These materials may change throughout the course. Students are required to maintain reliable internet and a working computer device. There's no way around this. You gotta have reliable internet. I just, I, I expect that of you, you have to. Um, so that, that is what it is, you're gonna have to do that. And, uh, and a working computer device, a laptop, a desktop, tablets don't work as well because they don't interact fully with Blackboard, phones don't work as well. I know you'll be in a jam sometimes, you'll have to read and do assignments on your phone, but you really need to have, uh, have some sort of a, a proper computer device. A laptop or desktop is preferable for forms and tap, for phone and tablets are not reliable for all course tasks. Should a movie or documentary be assigned that is not on YouTube, students are responsible for acquiring access via streaming services. Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu, whatever. If I assign something on those, you're gonna be responsible for finding someone that has access to it if you don't have it to watch it. I don't have anything assigned right now, but I may have suggested stuff, extra credit things, I might add some stuff throughout the course that could be on any one of those services. Most of my collegiate friends tell me that their students are always able to find access somehow to this. I don't know, and I, I the, the, the whole, there should be a way that through access to the library, you should be able to get access to everything. I don't know if there is or isn't. I, I've been unclear on this and well, we're living in the COVID times, everything is weird. All right, so what are our assignments? These are, our, this is what we're gonna be doing, doing. Online courses require more student activities than in-person classes. This is the trade-off for class at your own pace, on your own terms, in your preferred location. If you wanna do class in bed, if you wanna do class in your pajamas, if you wanna do class in your yard, if you wanna do class at the park, if you wanna do class on your commute. I don't know how you do that, but you could. Uh, all right, so each lesson contains readings, readings, do the reading, multimedia introductory materials, lectures, a discussion forum, and an assignment. You'll be asked to perform weekly assessments of the course and your performance that week. I call these exit tickets. In addition, you will have a midterm and a final paper. I am not planning a midterm uh, or final exam. Uh, though we will be writing online, students should approach all assignments and communication with a professor and other students as if these were papers submitted in class, handed in on paper. Use standard grammar, spelling, and punctuation. Do not use acronyms or internet slash text speech. All written work should be revised at least once, i.e. read over what you wrote before you hit the submit button. Cut and paste should be used only for direct quotes, which must be cited. I will say this once, I will say it again. Don't use cut and paste. Just, if you find something online that you wanna put into one of your assignments, or you find it in a book, retype it, Paraphrase it, don't copy and paste. Students plagiarize all the time by cutting and pasting and forgetting what they cut and pasted. And then they end up turning in something that someone else's work as a work. That's plagiarism. It can get you thrown out of college. Just don't use the cut and paste. Just forget that function even exists. Even if you see some, a little quote that you wanna do, just retype it. You'll trust me, the cutting and pasting leads to so many problems. All right, students are expected to read every word that I assign, though this is rarely possible in practice. I suggest students read with a purpose. <clears throat> this means you pre-read by skimming each text, and then only really in detail read the most relevant um, materials to the topic at hand for the lesson. So try, I want you to read everything. Nobody reads everything. I read everything when I was in my undergraduate and graduate work because I'm me. So, Read with the purpose. Skim over it real quick. Go, okay, this is what the lesson is about. Let me just really try to focus on what I think will be like the key passages that the professor is going to deal with or that will be important for me later. Um, read, in, read in detail and take notes on important sources, especially if those course materials appear relevant for your paper projects. We'll talk about paper projects a little later in the class, maybe like the second or third week. 
Optional and recommended reading assignments are truly optional, but they're good for you. Read them anyway, it'll be fun. Okay, supporting multimedia videos and news articles are meant to support the lecture. You'll get a bunch of videos um, before the lecture. They're meant to kind of warm you up. Watch them. Most students quite like them. If you don't, I, it won't hurt my feelings. Whenever possible, videos will show rituals and practices, portray religious sites, or support discussions or short assignments. Lectures will range in length, but they will always have PowerPoint, audio, and video. I'm an energetic speaker, obviously, and I hope you will find the lectures enjoyable. Most students actually do like them. Do not expect a monotone voice over a dreary PowerPoint. I'm committed to bringing my high impact performances from the lecture hall directly to your computer. I will make sure you have a PDF of the PowerPoint before you watch the lecture. <laughs> this one time I was teaching this yoga class and I was teaching it online and actually this bartender at a, at a place I used to hang around at uh, around the corner from my house was like, hey man, I'm in your class. And he told me that sometimes his girlfriend and him came home drunk and were like, well, uh, maybe we'll watch some TV or oh, let's just put on, uh, let's just put on Dr. Ulrich, see what he's got to say for the night. And I was like, well, eh, that warms my heart. Okay. Discussion boards are never really discussions, despite their promise to, to simulate in-person discussions. They're not. Discussion boards and discussion forums are not the same as class discussion. They're just not. Think of the discussion boards as group writing projects. You'll be asked to make an original post and then expand on other students' posts. Refrain from passing judgments, I think this is good, or proclaiming value, this is interesting. Just don't, don't even bother with those statements. Your task is to expand on posts, making further arguments, providing more data, or critiquing the arguments and asking further questions. Often you will be required to cite sources and bring in further research to support your posts and replies. Again, this is not really a discussion, but group writing in which students react, complicate, and add data to the assigned task. Discussion boards will also be used for paper writing support. Each group writing assignment will have a rubric, and while these are group assignments, students will only be assessed on their own performance. Almost every lesson will have a short writing assignment, mostly informal and creative using multiple styles and genres. Tasks may include writing a school newspaper article, a letter to a friend, a movie pitch, anthropology field report, and so on. You'll be asked to make videos and memes as well. Often these assignments will require you to engage the contents and then react from your own perspective or compare contents to your own experiences. My main goal in these assignments is to get you to reprocess the material and do something with them. Each short writing assignment will have a rubric. Community is hard to build online and professors struggle to get feedback when they cannot directly interact with students in person. This being the case, you will be assigned a weekly assessment of the class. These don't have a word count or a, ret or a rubric. If you do them, you get points. They're easy points. They're an easy 10 points, just bam. You can even write, Class was good. I feel lousy. Boom, that's enough. Boom, 10 points. Um, or you can write an extensive one page, you know, analysis of my performance or my poor performance and how much you hated the readings or how much you liked the readings. So 10 points, just do it and you get points. I use these in several ways to make adjustments to course design, reading and assignments within the class and for, next, for the future when I teach this class again, to nuance my assessment of student performance, to really get an idea of What's going on with you? If I, if I get a really clear understanding of if you're struggling that week, I'm probably gonna give you a little bit better of a grade than you would uh, usually get. Or, you know, you know or, or if you pretty much tell me, I didn't do any of the reading this week. Well, you know, I'll still probably give you a decent grade. Um, okay, and to just interact with students about the course and their status. So this is a chance for you to just basically like write, it's almost like you're writing an email to me once a week, telling me how you're doing and how the class is going. Students will write a midterm and a final paper. The midterm paper will be an exploration of a particular topic in a particular religion. The final paper will be cumulative and the students will use the research from the first paper to perform a comparison with some other religion or aspect of religion. As you can see, the module tasks above cause students to process course materials four times. You read it, you hear the lecture, you do the discussion forum, and then you apply it in some way in the assignment. Four times. Everything that we cover you're looking at four times. Furthermore, there are lots of chances to acquire points. I have never had a student who had done all the work earn a poor grade. If you just do the work, you will do well in this class. 
Grades are weighted in the following scale. Discussion and short assignment and exit tickets make up roughly 60%, it's probably more like 65, near 70, of your grade. So just keep up on the weekly work and you'll do great. The rest of your grade, roughly 40%, it's more like 30, uh, consists of midterm and final papers. As the course progresses, I will weight assignments differently based on complexity and importance. That's why I keep doing this um, as for the percentages, because I change the values as we go depending on the assessment. I, I wanna be able to move as much as possible with my assessment, mostly so I can give you the best grades you can get. The grading scale is quite simple. 100 to 90, A, 89 to 80, B, 79 to 70, C, 69 to 60, D, 59 and lower, F. I don't know why YSU does not have pluses or minuses, but they don't. So it's a pretty wide, it's a pretty wide bullseye and it's pretty clear where people are at between an A and a B and a C by the time I get to the end of it. Attendance and makeup policy. <laughs> this is an asynchronous course. So attendance will not be tracked in a traditional manner. You are responsible for fulfilling the assigned tasks before deadlines. Unsubmitted work will be graded zero at the time of grading. Don't get behind for it is very hard to catch up. If you just stay, a, stay ahead of things, stay on it, you're gonna do great in this class. Communication with a professor is key. Extensions are decided on a case-to-case -case basis. I don't want to give anybody extensions. Um, should a student contact the professor before deadlines pass? If you contact me before the deadline and say, I'm having a lot of trouble, can I get some more time? We'll talk about it. I will likely not give you more time, um, but I might. So you need to contact me. We'll, we'll work it out. Um, no extension will be granted if the professor is contacted after the deadline. So contact me early. Seriously, the minute you are behind uh, and under pressure and in danger of falling behind, contact me and make a plan for success. I want you to be successful. The goal of a professor teaching a class should be to mediate student success and learning. I'm not here to smack you down and give you a bad grade. I am here to support you. I'm here for you. Keep in mind Blackboard tracks and reports the number of times you access the software and time engaged in the software. So if you tell me you're working really hard and I've seen that you have only spent a half an hour online that week and my lecture is 40 minutes, that's gonna be a little problematic. Okay, policy statement regarding plagiarism. All assignments submitted must represent a student's own work. Plagiarism is a serious offense and will be dealt with accordingly. If you use the words or ideas of others without proper citation of your source, you may be suspended or expelled from the university. I take this very seriously. And if I suspect you have included any amount of material from uncredited sources, I will investigate vigorously. Just don't do it. Do not copy and paste, ever. If you just don't copy and paste, you'll do much. You'll reduce your risk of plagiarism quite a bit. Do not copy and paste ever in any of your assignments. Copy and paste misuse is at the root of almost all inadvertent plagiarism. Do not mine internet sources for material in your assignments. Oh, and also don't buy a paper online and submit it because I have so much of your writing from your short assignments and your discussion assignments that it will be obvious that you have uh, plagiarized. It will be so clear. And if I decide to take you to an academic tribunal, which I don't want to do, all I'll have to do is say, here's how the student writes in the discussion forum and their assignments. Here's the paper. These are completely different voices. This is a different style of writing. It will be obvious that, you, that it is someone else's work. Don't do it. I'll catch you. I'll catch you every time. I catch people every year. And it is something I don't like, and it makes me angry. Write your own paper. You'll probably spend less time writing your own paper than finding a way to steal a paper. Don't steal a paper. I'll catch you. Uh, do not mine internet sources for material in your assignments. Anytime you use information from a web page or online source or a book, you must either quote it directly and cite, or you must rewrite, paraphrase, and cite. If you just steal from Wikipedia, I will catch you because I find it every time. <laughs> Any instance of plagiarism can amount to dramatic repercussions, not excluding failing the class and even expulsion from the university. I always prefer evidence and quotes from course materials rather than outside sources, except in occasions when I specifically ask for outside research. Really, most of the time, I'm gonna be saying, all right, write on this thing. <coughs> and what I really want you to do is pull from what you read. You've already read it, assuming you read it, pull from there. 
don't pull from obscure sources that you've Googled. I don't, I don't like it. It's, it's not useful to me. And students often don't use that evidence well. Use material from the course. Now, if you are a student with a documented disability, this is in bold because it's a big deal, and would like to discuss special academic accommodations, please contact me during office hours at the beginning of the course. Um, just send me an email. Also, if you're an ESL student, English as a second language, please discuss this with me immediately. Um, I will change my assessment of you and I will give you as much support as I can. If you do not self-advocate, I cannot help you. Write me an email, tell me your situation, I got you. All right, uh, I take these accommodations very seriously and will do my best to help you. Understand that I understand the hardship of writing in, uh, in a foreign language, since my own work has involved learning numerous archaic Asian languages. I've spent a lot of time uh, being the non-native speaker in uh, India and Tibet and Nepal and Thailand. I know what it's like, it's hard, you just do it. It's miserable, I will support you in every way I can. Also, I'm dyslexic. Um, I understand what that means too. So if, if you got an IEP, let's work with it. Um, if you got ADHD and dyslexia or, or whatever learning difference you have, I got you. Um, also in my free time before COVID-19, I used to work as a special ed substitute teacher quite a bit. So I have a lot of experience working with people with learning differences. And I'm very amenable to that, but you got to tell me if you don't tell me, I can't help you. All right. So YSU has a bunch of policies. Let's just read through these really quickly. They're important to have on here. So accommodations for students with disabilities. In accordance with university procedures, if you have a documented disability and require accommodations to obtain equal access in this course, please contact me privately to discuss your specific needs. You must be registered with the Center for Student Progress Disability Services, located blah, 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 and provide a letter of accommodation to coordinate reasonable accommodations. Non-discrimination. Youngstown State does not discriminate on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, and or expression, disability, age, vet, religion, veteran military status in its programs or activities. In fact, I revel in these differences. So <laughs> wherever you're coming from, your difference is wonderful and you bring something more to the class. Um, I often have some high school students that will take this class, they're co-enrolled, fantastic. If you're uh, Asian or Middle Eastern, fantastic. You can bring so much to this class. Um, if you are African, you can bring so much to this class. If you're a Black American, you bring so much to this class. If you're a Chicano American, so much to this class. If you're a white guy, you bring so much to the class. <clears throat> we really are going to celebrate um, all of our perspectives, which brings so much to the project of understanding world religions. Academic integrity, as outlined in the uh, student of contact. All forms of academic dishonesty are prohibited at Youngstown State. This includes plagiarism, the unauthorized use of tools or notes in taking tests or completing assignments, fabrication of data or information used for an assignment, working with others without permission of the instructor. You can work together, I don't care. Uh, and more, a student who is believed to have violated the academic integrity policy will meet with the instructor to discuss the allegations. The student may accept responsibility for the violation and any sanctions selected by the instructor or they have the right to ask for a hearing before a hearing panel. Have fun with that. It's an online course. I have all the evidence that I need <laughs> based on your assignments to demonstrate academic dishonesty. Grading policies, they're explained there. Um, our server is set for Eastern Standard Time, so I will adjust it so that, um, that, that, that everything is set on Eastern Standard Time, even though I'm on Central Mountain Time, two hours behind you. Copyright notice, the instructor for this course created some or all of the materials posted here. They are copyright protected and for use only by students while taking the course. They may not be reproduced, displayed, modified, or distributed without the express prior written permission of your instructor. If permission is granted, all materials must contain copyright notice sent to the instructor. The other odd thing about that is like, if I wanted to like have a pal of mine, um, or like a local sort of religious person I work with here in Denver to join up with the class, it's not possible. So this copyright thing is kind of silly. It's really restrictive onto you. It doesn't actually give any freedom to me. Uh, Senate resolution on due process. The Ohio Public University presidents approved the resolution affirming that all public university students should be afforded due process. 
This process involves a student meeting with the instructor to discuss the complaint. If the student does not secure a satisfactory resolution at this meeting, then he or she may carry the complaint successfully or successively or yeah, successively to the appropriate uh, chair, the dean, the provost. If the complaint involves a grade for an assignment of a course, only the instructor will have the authority to make the change. Coronavirus syllabus statement. We live in the time of COVID-19. It has been a big suck of a year, 2020. Thankfully, we'll be online, so we won't have too many troubles with this. Um, I, I wish you the best of luck in your other classes that are in person. Stay safe, be careful, support your families. If Do everything you can to support one another in these trying times. But I should teach a class on world religions and contagions of plague. Huh, just thought of it, that'd be interesting. The following policy applies and shall be enforced during the current coronavirus pandemic as recognized by the state of Ohio. As a consequence, and we're almost done, I promise. As a consequence of the, as a consequence of the current coronavirus pandemic, students are expected to abide by all safety and health policies implemented by the university's Office of Environmental Occupation Health and Safety, as well as all applicable local, state, and federal mandates. Currently, the city of Youngstown and the state of Ohio mandates a face covering mask in public spaces consistent with federal, state, and local guidelines. University health guidelines require that all individuals within campus buildings, including students, properly wear face coverings except when working alone within an enclosed area. Face coverings are in addition to maintaining appropriate social distancing when possible, exceptions to face, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so uh, that's not an issue for us. So you'll see here, this is our week to week breakdown of modules of reading. I've broken up everything instead of week by week, but into modules. So first module, religious studies comparison and the weird, because the weird, the unexpected, the strange, whether it's an uncanny thing that happens to us and makes us go, wait, maybe there's ghosts. Wait, maybe there are angels. Wait, maybe there is a God. The uncanny tends to make us feel and think about religion but also when we look at stuff we don't expect because we're going to look at like exorcisms ghosts no bigfoots aliens <laughs> funeral rituals we're going to look at stuff that's kind of strange um we're not used to going to temples as westerners i was raised protestant christian myself um i'm ethnically protestant we're not used to walking into a temple with a whole bunch of like images of deities and glorious paintings around that's not what a church looks like but that's something's different. And when we see something that's different or weird, and I'll talk about the term weird a little bit more, it's an interesting word when we get right down to it, um, that's when we really see our world differently. And when we get kind of frazzled and, and confused, and we're like, wait a minute, Jews don't believe in souls? Well, what do I think about soul? Well, they do believe in souls, but they don't believe in an afterlife. How can you have religion without an afterlife? As a Protestant Christian, everything was about the afterlife and getting to heaven, or those bad people going to hell. If they don't have an afterlife, well, well, what do you do with that? <laughs> um, so yeah, when we see stuff that's odd, that strikes us odd, it shakes us up. Okay, beginnings, methods, comparison, and two Indians women's lives. We're gonna do some fantastic reading there. So the reading on this class is somewhat, I, I guess it's heavy. Um, it's lighter than when I've taught at other places, when I've taught courses like this, uh, but you're gonna have to plan ahead. I suggest you break it up. Look, uh, look a week in advance, see what you're gonna have to read, and just schedule yourself, yourself to read 20, 30 pages a day. And then just do it, you'll get through it, no problem. If you just try to jam through the reading you know, the night before, you'll probably be fine. The reading's not that heavy. Um, and I'll give you a heads up when there, are, when there is heavy reading. Also, when you see on the modules, I'm gonna give you um, reading questions to sort of guide your reading um, for every week. All right, then we're gonna look at the foundation of world religions and uh, religious studies in the West. We're gonna look at culture and cultures, the different types of cultures in the world. And on that one, we're gonna do a whole thing on magic. Um, and we're gonna look at some of my research uh, that, that I think you're gonna find kind of wild. If you wanna find a way to, I don't know, murder your neighbor or make someone you dislike go crazy, I might have a few tricks for you. All right, myth and rituals. This is gonna be cool because we're gonna do this whole thing on Vedic ritual. Um, Vedic India is the oldest uh, form of Hinduism and they have just these really intricate, crazy rituals. I've even got videos, you're gonna dig it. Uh, natural and supernatural beings. 
you're gonna like this because we are going to do all sorts of cool stuff here. We're actually gonna do exorcism and possession. We're gonna talk about what does it mean to use invisible beings to do magic. Also, what does it mean when a being possesses a person and causes them suffering? Or alternatively, when a God possesses a person and it's good and benevolent. And then we're gonna to turn to the body. We're gonna talk about sex. We're gonna talk about yoga. We're gonna talk about tantra. That's not tantra, that's tantra. Um, good stuff. Charismatic religious authorities. This is a great unit. Uh, I think you're gonna dig this. Um, it's about various holy people. And we're gonna look at a very good holy man in Narayans, uh, saints, scholars, and scoundrels. Then we're gonna talk about um, one particular Hindu monk who very much changed the world. Then we're gonna talk about some somewhat sketchy gurus. And we're going to close with a really great piece from Harper's um, about cult deprogrammers. And then we're going to talk about magic powers. We're going to talk about yogis. We're going to talk about aliens. We're going to talk about magic men that do magic in our gurus. We're going to talk about death in the afterlife. This is a great unit because we're going to talk about death rituals in India that are really different. And we're going to talk about the state of the soul and reincarnation as it's established in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Um, applied interpretations. Here we're actually going to look specifically at folk religion and vernacular religion, and we're going to look at um, positive interactions between Hindus and Muslims in villages in India. When we look at religion and politics, we're going to look at a lot about religion and violence. Uh, in that, we're going to talk about a particular issue uh, that's called the Babri Mas Masjid, which is a mosque that is in Ayodhya in India that in the 90s was torn down because they said it was a temple, uh, that, that it was the place where a god was born originally. But there's actually no evidence of that being the case. And the mosque is probably quite old and there was likely never a temple there. Um, but it was torn down in the 90s and um, then it was vowed to be rebuilt. 30 years later, the recent uh, president of India, Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, uh, declared that he was gonna build the temple. He's a Hindu fundamentalist and a Hindu nationalist, and this was actually covered in uh, the Western press because he announced it in the West. And finally, we're gonna do wondrous religion, where we're gonna look at really just these beautiful Hindu temples and how the one of the greatest things about religion, this is where I really wanna end, is wonder how you go into a temple or you go to a religious service or you hear um, Gregorian monks chanting and you're filled with joy. And wonder, I want, to add, I want to end our class with this discussion of wonder. How, why are we religious? Because it's really cool and it fills us with joy. Um, despite all, you know, all my possession and aliens and whatnot before, I want to end with that, the, the glories of religion. Uh, in our final day, um, we're going to talk about um, some of these ideas of natural and the supernatural. And I want to talk about <laughs> a, temp a Hindu temple that's in Pittsburgh in the United States. All right. That's the class. Thanks for taking it. We're gonna have a good quarter. Um, all right, I will see you next time. So you got a discussion assignment uh, today, which is going to be recording a little video introduction and I'll record one too. All right, take care.